Hey there, welcome to another episode of the Sage Mindset Podcast. I'm excited to be here with you today. I am your host, Kyle Gillette, and the owner of Gillette Solutions, and also the creator of the Sage Leadership Framework. What is Sage? Well, Sage is the idea that all great leaders are Sage leaders, and that is they are self-aware, they have powerful accountability in their life and their business, they have a growth mindset, and they empower others to do and achieve amazing things things. Well, my guest today is Mahadi Makamala, and he does exactly those things for the business that he is running with his partner and also in the organization that he works for. So I'm excited for you to learn about his Thropic.app business and also about the work that he's doing for Forms.com. Calm. He's a talented senior financial professional with wide and deep experience in evaluating systems and developing clear, cogent models that drive effective business decisions. He combines an obsessive attention to detail with a far-sighted view of the future. He develops processes that significantly improve the bottom line. And what's really amazing is in this interview, you'll see that he's playing that out into his own business in really powerful ways. And the impact that it is making and it will make is going to be and is really amazing. So Hey, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Sage Mindset Podcast. I've got Mahadi here with me, and I'm excited to chat with you about him and what he's done and the experiences that he's had and the wisdom that he has to share with you. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. So the first question I have, and you kind of have a unique answer already compared to most people, and that is share a little bit about the story of what inspired you to start your business. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So I, um, you know, f- met my co-founder uh, kind of serendipitously, uh, you know, one day when we were both at, you know, a shared working space um, and we both went to an event and uh, both of our stories kind of clicked in terms of, you know, what really gets us out of bed and what's our purpose uh, for sort of waking up every day uh, and, you you know, doing something other than just making money, right? Um, so not to say money isn't important, not to say, you know, uh, I went to school for business, I got my MBA in business, so not to say I'm averse to capitalism or money, but um, I just felt like there's more to life than just uh, making money. And so we started this thing um, to um, have a sense of purpose in life. Can you tell nah. us what... The, what what's the name of the business? Yeah, it's called Thropic. Uh, so it's a play off of uh, the word philanthropic. Um, and what we're trying to do or what we are in the middle of doing is trying to um, create a um, donor management software uh, for small nonprofit organizations. So, uh, you know, kind of trying to give smaller nonprofits a one shop uh, stop for, you know, creating their campaigns for any sort of, uh, donor related thing that they're trying to do, creating their social media awareness, uh, you're doing the, the capture and sending the, um, you know, tax and tax implications of people donating and managing all that form, uh, you know, doing a little bit of gamification with prize logic and, and that type of stuff. So, uh, trying to, you know, really help the smaller nonprofits who may not have the budgets and the marketing budgets to create effective campaigns, to create, uh, you know, these elaborate uh, websites and all that. Um, we're trying to do that for them. That sounds like a fantastic idea. I mean, I, I can think of a several nonprofits right now off the top of my head that, that are smaller and they're making a huge impact, but they're smaller and then they can make an even larger impact with with the software that you're talking about and the support. Yeah. So is it, it's a software, but it's also uh, support kind of consulting type support as well? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So um, we think of it as just, you know, sort of people helping people um, where, you know, it's, we'll get on the phone, we'll try to map out what it is that they're looking for um, and then try to get them as close to what they're looking for as possible. Right. And that could be a suite of things. Um, so what, you know, hey, we'll host your campaign, we'll make your campaign, we'll promote your campaign, uh, or we just need some help with, you know, how should the campaign look? Or, you know, you might say, hey, we have it all, we're hosting it on, you know, some other platform. There's a lot of good platforms out there for hosting, um, you know, campaigns like GoFundMe is another big one that people use. Um, but you might need help with attracting people, you might need help with the graphic arts or so on and so forth to try and really get the word out there. So um, 
yeah, we're uh, we're trying to make a small impact uh, for these smaller nonprofits. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, you know, when we get off this interview, I definitely want to connect you up with a couple people because there's there's some things that they're doing that's really amazing, and it'd be great for you to be able to help them too. Yeah. So what what's the second? You're doing this other thing as well. T- tell us about this the other thing that you're doing. Yeah, so I work full time as well because, uh, like I said, uh, you know, uh, I did go to school, and that does come with bills. Uh, so I work full time as a head of FPNA for a software company, um, which you know effectively pays the bills. So what's um, and that company is called Form Form dot com, and so we uh, we work with you know the opposite side. We work with enterprise uh, customers to try and help them automate um, all of their uh, form solutions. So whether it's, you know, uh, inspections, whether it's uh, any sort of data management that people are doing manually across you know, different platforms, we try to help them automate all of that. And then um, we do a little bit of image rec, uh, image recognition type of stuff where, um, or we're, we're, you know, going to have a big focus on that if, uh, you know, if you're uh, Anheuser-Busch or if you're, you know, any of the uh, beverage companies and you go into a, a store and you're looking at a cooler and trying to you know audit whether the stores are doing what they said they were going to do or if there's something missing or something's out of place from an inspection perspective you know being able to take a picture and have that message relayed back instead of mm-hmm. uh, in a connected format instead of you know uh, that person going back to their their computer and, and entering something and then having some sort of a data loss there um, so we're trying to uh, make the world a little more efficient, I suppose. Yeah, totally. I, I could see the value of that because especially when there's a thousand transactions that help happen or 10,000 transactions that happen like that, where it's easy to lose the information that's super pertinent or at least super helpful. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, just trying to eliminate extra steps, right? Um, so that's that's sort of you know using artificial intelligence, which is now the buzzword, but using it effectively to actually help people and actually save steps along the way right um a lot of us think of ai in terms of taking jobs away um and i actually think that it's making jobs more efficient so you're able to do more and get more out of the job that you're doing versus uh you know eliminating a job per se right and the ai excuse me the ai also is going to help the uh the customer or the client on the on the end you know the end user gets a lot of benefit from it as well as it gets as it understands you better or it's leveraged by people more and more. So there's huge benefits to AI. I'm, I'm using that right now in my business for various purposes and it's saving me loads of time that I, that I wouldn't even do if I didn't have that AI available. I wouldn't even pursue it at all. Yeah. And I, you know, I, and you know, most people that work with here with me um, that I get to have contact with every day, uh, you know, with, it really does start with the customer, right? Uh, that's usually a cliche and that's a big Amazon cliche that, you know, they ask you that in interview, every interview that you ever have with Amazon is the customer focus, but it really does start with the customer, right? So you can have the most amazing artificial intelligent process, but if it's not helping the end consumer end customer or the whatever the end product is, whoever is using it, it's not really gonna matter. It's not really gonna impact anybody. It's not really gonna come all the way back to you, right? Same thing for the customer is it, when they're doing it that way, it helps their customers, right? So it just kind of follows that yep. path all the way down, which I yeah. think is what good business is supposed to do. And my guess is that mentality, that attitude is baked into your this nonprofit work that you're doing because you realize that, that well, in, no business has a bunch of extra time to, to waste or anything, but these smaller nonprofits, they're super tight financially. And so to give, to think in that way and to bring that type of thinking to the table for them is going to be really helpful for them. Yeah, I think helping, you know, I think the theme, I suppose, in every aspect of what I do for work, even though I work in finance, is, you know, how can we help um, make things more efficient, right? It really, that's what it comes down to. Um, How can we make things more efficient so that, whether it's a nonprofit that can get to work and do the best, be the best that they can be, or how can our customers be the best, you know, store or, or whatever that they can be. Um, and I think it really just comes down to the efficiency process, right? Removing waste, removing, as you said, 
uh, making time be more valuable because that's quite literally the only resource that we can't pay for anymore. Yeah, well, it's interesting because one of the keys for me when I'm working with my clients is is they come to me and they usually have some sort of a, of a time struggle. They don't have control of their time. They need to block it. They need to uh, figure out what's most important to focus on. But as soon as you get control of that and you start to leverage that in an effective way, now you have the time freedom. You have the, the, the space to think about the higher level things instead of being so focused on right in front of you with the blinders on. And that is super helpful. So I want to change gears a little bit with you here. With your experience uh, in, in your current business and your experience with your employer, can you talk to us a little bit about what's, what's your greatest failure up to this point, whether it was before these current experiences or, or during, what, what jumps out to you as that big failure and what did you learn from it? Yeah, I think, um, I think my biggest failure um, to date, from a business perspective, uh, when I was really young, I started a business um, with, with a good mindset and a good idea, uh, where, um, I wanted to connect college students with what it's really like post-college. Um, so whether that's skill sets, whether that's, um, you know, how to interview properly, how to ask for a first raise, uh, how to sort of navigate the, the initial when we all first grad, I graduated undergrad in 2009. So when we all first graduated, that initial pushback that we got from prior generations of, oh, you know, these kids just want to be CEO day one, or, oh, these kids just want to do everything. And I wanted to try and bridge that gap of how do you stay hungry, ask for more without offending the, the people in power, if you will. Um, so I wrote a few articles about that on LinkedIn and, uh, trying to make that into a business didn't quite work out. Uh, so from a business perspective, I guess that, that was, that was something I really wanted to do. I just couldn't pull it out properly. Um, uh, the work failure in my subject, um, I think is, I was told at a very young age that, you know, uh, there's something called the burden of knowledge, um, where if I know something, it's my job to effectively communicate what I know to the other party, whether that's, you know, in the example of Samsung and the batteries mm -hmm. blowing up, whether that's me knowing that, hey, these batteries are no good and we shouldn't put them in phones, uh, or whether that's, you know, me being an Enron and saying, hey, what we're doing is wrong, we shouldn't do this. Uh, and, you know, if you're not able to effectively communicate that, then it's your job to walk away from that situation but I still, I think I'm unclear as to how to do that properly, because in a binary format, if someone's doing something that you disagree with, that is wrong, that you know is wrong, you have the information that it's wrong, you present that information. Um, my biggest failure to date and something I'm still working on learning how to be better at it is how do I actually convince somebody? Because walking away doesn't stop the bad from happening the bad is still going to happen. I've just made sure that I'm not associated with the bad, which is a very selfish way of uh, surviving corporate America, if you will, right? And, and people do that all the time. People say, look, this is, this is not, you know, if you want to do it, do it. I don't want to deal with it. I've told you it's wrong. I'm going to walk away. Um, I'm still working on figuring out how to positively affect that change uh, in saying, hey, look, doing this is bad. Here's why it's bad. Here's the greater consequences of the bad, and we should not do it. Um, I think that's that's something that I've failed at before. I can't name the company for obvious reasons, but um, that still sits with me as I still don't know how to do it properly um, for multiple reasons, shareholder value, pressure from the board, what, whatever reason why people do the wrong thing that they do, uh, I believe that it's, if I know it's wrong, it's my responsibility to convince them. Um, and if I'm not, I'm still unclear as to how to change that outcome. Yeah, that takes a ton of courage to do that because at first it takes courage to step away just without even saying anything. 
And then second, it takes a significant amount more of courage to say, hey, I'm stepping away, but there's some things that need to change. And I want to help make that change happen. So what does that look like? Who knows, right? It's per situation, but it's it's about influence. Ultimately, I would assume is is how can you be influential with the people that are influential already in that organization? Because th- then the change starts to happen. But if you just stir up a fuss, nobody's going to care. Because <laughs> if you don't have that influence, it isn't going to make a difference. So that's a very courageous thing. And, and, and I love the attitude in general that you have about what you're doing currently with forms, what you're doing with your with your nonprofit business and then this idea here too it's all let's make let's make a longer term difference it's more of a legacy impact versus a, a flash in the pan and and that's a huge deal so with that in mind what are some of the goals that you have for the impact that you want to have going forward you know your the future impact that you want what are some of those goals that you have uh personally yeah i think uh you know, I, I joke about this a lot, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, did it really fall, right? And, you know, we all effectively live 60 to 70, call it 80 years on average. Um, and when we pass away, it's kind of what Homer said in his poems, right? And are we just dust and bones? And the only people that are remembered are the immortal ones, right? Um, so my goal is to make an impact, whether it's me or my likeness that's remembered, the work I do, I want to be remembered and lasting through uh, through time for as long as it can. Uh, I know initially I, I was always obsessed with this idea of lasting through time. Uh, you used to want to be a civil engineer, you wanted to build structures that you know stood through time and centuries. Uh, I was really bad at chemistry, so probably saved a lot of people by not becoming a civil engineer. Uh, there's been a lot of <laughs> a lot of bridges that probably wouldn't have been standing right now, or a lot of buildings that uh, that probably wouldn't have stood <laughs> the test of a windstorm, let alone time. Uh, but now I, I, you know, I wanna try and shift my focus into um, eventually uh, trying to figure out a way where, you know, there's a lot of, uh, Hassan Minaj said this on his show one time, there's a lot of tabs that are open in my mind of, mm-hmm. you know, there's this problem and that problem and, and, and all these problems. And I want to apologize to your audience for coughing here. Um, yeah. but I want to try and pick a, pick a lane, you know, um, early childhood education for young girls in uh, third world countries is something that I care a lot about. Um, uh, you know, we're seeing the vaccination um, disparity between, you know, rich and poor nations. And I come from India, I moved here when I was 13. And, you know, you know almost to an end of one now where, you know, my relatives have had trouble getting vaccines and, uh, and you know, the, the wave in India that they've gone through. Uh, so, and, and a lot of that is just, uh, you know, kind of us sitting on the perch of privilege a little bit, right? Uh, we have, we can go down and the CVS and, you know, if you have an upset stomach, you can get Pepto or you can get, you know, whatever it is to make your stomach feel good, uh, where people literally die overseas with diarrhea and diphtheria and, uh, you know, things that we take for granted uh, that, that really affects and changes lives across the way. Um, so that's something that I, you know, eventually want to get into uh, at, at a smaller community level. There's a lot of great organizations, I think, doing a lot of great work. Obviously, the Bill and Melinda Foundation are doing amazing work, and they're doing what they're doing. But even as we see with the COVID vaccine, it's the smaller communities that um, uh, that are harder to reach to uh, because they don't trust establishments or they don't trust big the bigness of certain things. So I want to try and help those smaller communities in in a very personal way um, and hopefully make a small difference. Well, I love how what you're already doing with your business partner is connecting that goal, that vision to reality, because a lot of people have visions, they have desires that they want to see happen, but they don't, they're not doing anything about it, unfortunately. And, and sometimes they just don't know how, but you've taken this vision and, and at a minimum, you're serving these, these small nonprofits that they're making a huge difference. I mean, these nonprofits make such a huge difference, regardless of the, the topic or the, you know, the industry they're in. Uh, and, and 
So with that clear vision you have already in your mind, you're already moving towards it in really powerful ways. So I, you know, I applaud you for that. And I think it's amazing. We're not ending the show right now, but, but I want to have you share the name of that business so people can connect with you on that business that you recently started. If they're interested in learning more about it, what's the name of that business again, which one, the, the nonprofit, the consulting business, the software stuff you're doing with them. Uh, Tropic T H R O P I C. Yeah. So check out Tropic, Tropic Tropic.com. Tropic.app. Dot app. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Definitely listeners check that out. Cause I know every single one of you knows it probably 10 nonprofits. If you just like dug through your contacts, you'd know 10 nonprofits and Tropic can serve them in powerful ways. So check that out for sure. So let me jump to a little bit of a different topic with you here. So when you, when you think about, let's say when you were nine years old, 10 years old even, and if you were gonna give your 10 year old version of yourself advice from what you know up to this point, what would, what would those three points of advice be? Uh, I don't, you know, I think, I think, it, you hear this a lot with pro athletes uh, as well. Uh, I think don't be so hard on yourself when you're younger. You know, things tend to fall into place. Uh, they always tend to fall into place. Uh, you know, stick with the process. Don't worry so much about the recency bias of this person didn't like me or that person didn't like me or these shoes. You know, I didn't have these shoes or I didn't have those shoes. Um, you know, I think uh, I think those things as you grow older, you you really don't remember all those nights you probably lost being sad about things that probably aren't worth being sad about. Um, and that's the second piece of advice I probably give people is time is, you know, as you get older, you start to realize time is probably the only thing that's actually really important in this world. Uh, whether it's time with people you care about, whether it's time spent laughing, whether it's time spent doing things you enjoy, um, don't take those moments for granted. Yeah, it makes me think that when you said that, I'm thinking that time is really the only true asset we have because it's the only, everything else is, it just kind of fades away or whatever, but really time is the, the real asset that we can provide for anybody. I mean, if, if I give somebody a bunch of money, yeah, that's nice, that's helpful, but really it's the investment in that relationship and investment of my time that's the most powerful asset there. So Great. makes a lot of sense. What would be your third third piece there? Uh, value friendships. I think good friends, uh, and I'm lucky enough to still have, maybe not friends from nine when I was nine, but I'm still lucky enough to have friends from when I was 12 and 13. Uh, cherish those friendships uh, because we live in a very transient world now and we live in a very transactional world now. And uh, you know a lot of people surround you because of what you can add to them. Uh, and you always hear that, you know, show me your show me your circle and I'll show you your value or show me who you hang out with and I'll show you this or that. Right. Uh, and that's that people take that literally. And, you know, if you're doing well, people sort of gravitate towards you because of that, show me who's in your circle sort of a thing. And I think it's kind of important to have those friends that have taken a journey with you. Right. Um, obviously be smart, you know, don't get yourself into trouble. Uh, but I still have friends that, you know, we played Madden together. Uh, we, you know, we played wiffle ball outside in parking lots, uh, you know, and not there having kids. And it's kind of nice to bridge those generations. And we don't do that a lot anymore because of the transient nature. People move away, people move to college, different towns and whatnot. And I think cherishing friendships, and making good quality friends when you're younger, that, you know, those people will stay with you through your 20s, through your 30s, through your 40s. Um, I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, my wife and I have some friends that we made when we were living in California. And I was, I had finished college and then we met and then I was friends with these folks already and then all of us got married. And so the three guys hung out a ton in college, but then we wanted to continue hanging out. And, and now to this day, which it's been, you know, gosh, 15 years or something, we're still every summer we spend three, at least three nights together in some VRBO or whatever to, to hang out. And it's like, nothing's changed. You know, you, you go and you hang out with those friends and nothing's changed. We're all from different cities and we're in a different state than the other two couples, but we get together and all the kids get along great. The, the couples get along great. We're just hanging out. And 
you can't you can't buy that there's there, there's no way it's it's time it's investment in relationship over time and there is nothing like it that you know you could give up so much i could give up so much to to get more of those types of relationships because they're 100 percent worth it yeah i couldn't agree more i think i think um it's ultimately what makes our life is those moments right uh and i think those moments spent with good people that, that have known you for a long time it's very easy to get caught up in the hype of everything um and as you start to earn more wealth as you start to make more money yeah life is good you you make a lot of new friends and you get access to a lot of different things uh but there's nothing like you know going to an empty parking lot throwing the car lights on you know taking a little lawn chair putting it up and, and having a wiffle ball game right it literally that would that was summer nights for us growing up and i'm still friends with a lot of those guys uh, and we we'll still talk about you know those type of things, right? Those stolen moments of happiness, I think, yeah. are are pretty amazing. Well, uh, and if you continue them; they're pretty great. It's funny you bring up uh, wiffle ball. We we did we did uh, ultimate frisbee. You know, we we park in the, in a Save Mart parking lot and then just play ultimate frisbee. I don't know how we did it on an asphalt because that's crazy, <laughs> sprinting around. But I guess that's that's high school for you, right? When your body can handle a lot more <laughs> than it can today. But no, I love that. Um, when it when it comes to the best way for people to connect with you and learn more about what you do, what, what's the best way for people to directly reach you? Obviously, we know Thropic app, but what's another way for people to connect with you? Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, Mahadi Mukamala. Uh, I'm sure the the information will be in the you know I'll send you guys a link. Uh, and then Instagram, um, my Instagram ID is uh, my first name and zero six zero three. So um, I'm not on any other social media, but those two are great. Uh, and I'll send you my email. So uh, those two are probably the greatest uh, or easiest ways to, to try and get, get connected with me. Perfect. Well, thank you for, for sharing with us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And I'm super inspired by your the business, by Thropic. I think that's fantastic. And I'm excited to see where that goes for you. Thank you. Thank you very much.